Good evening, my name is Malcolm Clemens Young and I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, California. And it's good to have you all here online during these um, COVID days when we're um, sheltering in place here in San Francisco. The coronavirus pandemic disproportionately impacts people of color and it's revealed the ongoing disastrous consequences of racism and inequality in our country. As people of faith, we must ask, is there a relationship between Christian religion and white supremacy in the United States? And how might we start to disentangle them and work to foster racial healing in America? My guest this evening is Janine Hill Fletcher, professor of theology at Fordham University and author of Monopoly on Salvation, a Feminist Approach in Religious Pluralism, Motherhood as Metaphor, Engendering Interreligious, Interreligious Dialogue, and most recently, The Sin of White Supremacy, Christianity, Racism, and Religious Diversity in America. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. It's Thanks such a pleasure to see you, Janine, um, staying up late so that you could be on our program. We're really glad to have you. Thanks for uh, having me join you, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's funny, I, I, I don't know why this question popped into my head, because it's, it's one of those questions that you just don't ask your fellow doctoral students. But now all these years have passed, I can ask you, why do you believe in God? <laughs> wow, Malcolm gets right to the heart of it. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. I didn't think of it. I didn't want to start with the easy ones. Yeah. We know each other. We love each other. Yeah. The, I, I come back to what I think is a, a grounding in the theologian, uh, Karl Rahner, who allowed me to recognize my own experience as a human being in the world surrounded by mystery. And he asks us to look out on that mystery that is the condition of our existence and really to, to, to ponder, is this mysterious existence that's so full of beauty and love and hope and, and future and family and relationships, is that ultimately meaningful or is it ultimately meaningless? That's, that's kind of his baseline question. Um, and he, he allows that to be a question. And so the question of why do you believe in God is a question that's rooted for me in, in hope and trust and the experience of meaning. So, so I, I kind of, you know, I get to the point every once in a while, I say, why do I? Why would I believe in God? And, I, and it's a deep sense of trust that whatever that mystery is that brought us into this world um, has some sort of a vision and plan and design that is the ground of that meaningfulness and beauty and, 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 and hope and faith. Um, so that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, it's funny that we, I, I, I'm reading um, Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics right now. I'm going to read Karl Rahner's Foundation again. I read it in like Theological Method or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love that, just his sense of the mystery that we are to ourselves, kind of that, that Kantian sense that we can't even know how we will behave in you know, a given circumstance, that, that there's something and, profound in us. And he, he has this line in the, in the opening of Foundations. Uh, he asks the question, what do we love more, the island of our so-called knowledge or the sea of infinite mystery? Yeah. And that's his sense of, of, of God at work in our lives and in our world. And this sense of, yeah, I mean, right before we got on, Malcolm says, oh, I'm, I'm learning new things in this new COVID situation. Uh, and, and the sense of being openness to new possibilities, the sense that the mystery is not something that crushes in on us, but opens us up to, to possibilities um, is that, that kind of metaphor that Ronner has in the beginning of that book that just, you know, I, I feel like I'm on that island of so-called knowledge and I look out on my world and I'm drawn into ever greater possibilities and Ronner invites me to consider that, those, that the source of all of those possibilities is a reality that Christians have given the name God to. Yeah. Well, I love that. And I know that your island is much bigger than my island. I'm on a very small island. There's a room for a little one palm tree and then lots of mystery. We actually have a stained glass window. Carl Rahner is in a stained glass window at Grace Cathedral. Wow. Are you serious? Yeah, right wow. near Martin Buber. Wow. Um, 
in the mid sixties, we put this huge stained glass window in, and Carl Rahner's right in there. But anyway, I'm, I'm so, yeah. I'm, I, I, I think about that and I think oh, that is a wonderful and sophisticated answer. And I wonder too, just, you know, how your faith has changed over time too. It's just like, you know, how did you get from like the childhood faith um, that you had when you were growing up to, to now, uh, you know, it, it, and you know, how, how has that progressed over time? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, my childhood faith, was very blessedly rooted in a very vibrant uh, Vatican II Catholic culture. So I may have been one of the last of the generations of people who grew up just absolutely, I went to school with the people who I went to church with. They were in my neighborhood. They were my best friends. I was surrounded by uh, this rich cultural sense of being part of a faith tradition. Um, but at the same time, my next door neighbor was a, uh, a non-denominational Christian with a, with a much more conservative leaning than, than my household. And we as best friends kind of grew up with this theological uh, kind of sharing in each other's worldviews in a way that really challenged both of us to, to recognize the limits of our agreement, but not the limits of our love for each other. Um, so that was, a, so the, the, those two dimensions of my uh, kind of formative experience as a, as a, as a kid, really, um, this rich sense of, you know, the, the liturgical practice in the Catholic Church post-Vatican II was all music and dancing and, and drama. And, you know, that was really uh, a living experience and a live experience that was really quite full. Um, I went to a Jesuit high school uh, that, that really uh, instilled in me a sense of a faith that needs to do justice uh, and went on to the Jesuit Volunteer Corps and spent a year as a volunteer uh, living in, a, you know, a simple lifestyle and spirituality and social justice. Um, and in that uh, young adulthood, uh, just before um, je uh, the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, I was part of a retreat group at my, at, in the Newman Center of my uh, public university. Again, a very rich Catholic culture, but here now as college students, testing out our theologies and really being tested, right, in a, in a place where when we introduced ideas about uh, uh, feminine images for God, there were people who said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that, right? That's against what we, so wait a minute, who said that that's against what we believe? So it really was this sense of testing faith within communities um, that kind of expanded my sense of um, the growth and the ongoing transformation of my own understanding of God and my own understanding of being part of a tradition. Uh, and so the sense of doing all that work in a community uh, and getting to the point right before I met you, right before graduate school, um, where the Catholic Church was no longer a vibrant and living experience for me. It was a, an experience of uh, of uh, walls being put up, women not being uh, in leadership positions, uh, the increasingly vocal stance against uh, LGBT people, uh, and a sense of closedness in relation to other faith traditions. Um, and so I went to graduate school kind of with this sense of a deep love for a tradition and a deep sense of, of, of longing for it to be something better uh, than what I was, had received. Um, so I hope that I've stayed faithful to that sense of being deeply rooted in a tradition and always wanting to, to, to find new ways of, of exploration and articulation. What do you see in terms of just like Catholic life now? I mean, like Pope Francis, there's a lot of excitement in Roman Catholic circles about him and his papacy. Um, do you think, uh, what, like, what signs of change do you see now? I mean, um, is there hope that in our time there, there will be um, ordained women in the Roman Catholic Church or, uh, you know, a, a more progressive stand on some of these other social issues? Uh, I, I, this, so that was, a, that was a complicated question leading me in one direction. Um, the Pope is, uh, is uh, engaged in the world in many ways. 
Um, on the issue of women's ordination, there has been no movement. Uh, I don't think that that is uh, one of his pressing concerns. Um, so in our lifetime, Malcolm, unless we live a very long time, uh, I suspect that will not be uh, the, uh, a piece of the institutional church that will change. Um, and it's also still a deeply divided church. Um, it's a deeply divided church in terms of uh, those who have the sense that, that Francis is uh, too radical in his commitment to uh, uh, the world and the needs of the world. Uh, there's a sense of dividedness there. Uh, there's also a deep sense of hurt. Uh, there's a lot of young people in the church um, and, and people of, of, of my, of our generation who have been hurt by the uh, abuse crisis, right? Yeah. That was my generation of, of young people in, my, in our parishes. Um, and so the future of the Catholic Church, uh, always a great question. Uh, my uh, great hope is in the graduate students, especially that I see, um, who help me to um, to see the ways that the church can live uh, in lots of places and in lots of uh, diverse articulations and especially those articulations um, uh, that are oriented towards justice. Um, my greatest, my greatest, um, what's the word, inspiration for the future of the Catholic Church actually comes from uh, locations of Catholic activism so I was recently asked to speak uh, as a, a witness for uh, a group of Catholic anti-nuclear war activists who, uh, who um, uh, trespassed on a nuclear uh, war base of the naval base at Kings Bay in Georgia. Uh, and who are now facing 20 years in prison for their action and their stance on behalf of humanity. And when they broke onto that base, we, they, they had a GoPro camera, and so they filmed the whole thing. They broke onto the base and they got as close to uh, the nuclear weapons uh, bunker as they could. And they, and they sat together and they prayed uh, the Hail Mary. And when we were watching that in the courtroom uh, during the proceedings uh, of their trial, we were watching that GoPro camera and them saying the Hail Mary and those of us Catholics on the, pew, uh, on the seats in the courtroom, which felt like pews, were also saying that prayer. And so this sense of being part of a tradition over, over you know, thousands of years and yet carrying it on in difficult times in heroic ways, I think that's still possible. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, it, it's interesting too, because I, I can see just like the threads of all these different parts of your life just um, really coming together in the work that you're doing now. And I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how the, um, the sin of white supremacy just kind of came into being as a project for you. Um, yeah. Sure. It's a wonderful book, and, and I, I, I just love how readable it is and accessible it is to people, and just how frank you are and honest you are about, you know, really looking at the tradition with open eyes. And, and I, I love that it comes from, a, you know, your Catholic-rooted position, but also it's, you know, it's really open to all Christians and, and anybody who wants to understand that dynamic of racism and its connection to religious life. So one of, the, one of the most important things to know is that I went through Catholic school. I went on to the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. I did a doctoral degree at a, at a premier in, you know, theological institution. I got tenure at a prestigious Catholic uh, college university. Uh, and I never once had to say anything about racism or white supremacy to be recognized in all of those ways, to earn those degrees, to be recognized as a theologian. Um, and so I, I look at this project as actually uh, a project in which I learned uh, not from theologians, um, but from uh, social workers and from activists and from my community um, in the neighborhood around uh, the university in the Bronx. So the, the, the project came out of uh, my own uh, commitments to justice in my work in our service learning program. And the service learning program 
brought students and faculty into the local community to work on projects of, of, of justice. Um, nice people, students, faculty member, good students, well-meaning students, many of whom were doing this work out of faith commitments, but they would go into the work of, of uh, justice and nonprofit in the Bronx, and they would experience that work as problems that the Bronx community had, right? Oh, if they could only, if, they, if the teachers could teach better, if the kids behaved better, if the parents cared more. Um, and so all of this work with service learning, which was, which was coming out of people's big hearts and Christian commitments, they were largely um, white students in our predominantly white institution, our predominantly white university, heading into communities of color and blaming the people in those communities for the problems of poverty. And we as a service learning program realize that we really cannot send white students and white faculty into communities of color with, without a mindset, without an analysis of the problems of racial injustice, right? Of the histories of racial injustice, that they're not individual problems, right? They're social problems, they're communal problems, they're historical problems. Um, so the sin of white supremacy as a, as a text, if you read in the opening, maybe the preface, came out of that work of good hearted white Christians wanting to be good people doing work in the world and perpetuating right, the problems of uh, uh, not seeing the sources of poverty, inequality, uh, and the social challenges in, in our world. Um, and so through that work really, really came to um, undertake the training that was necessary as a white theologian who hadn't had this training myself, had to take the training necessary. And we worked with the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. And they do a full two and a half day workshop where they essentially say, look, you need to know the history of racialized disparity. You need to know the history of dispossession and oppression in this country to do anything about racism in our world. Yeah. So when you um, undertook the research, what, what surprised you the most as you were, you were doing the research for this book? I mean, um, you probably had some preconceived notions about how it would be. And, you know, how did things, um, how are things a little bit different from that? Yeah. So the, the, uh, when I started doing this anti-racism work, uh, I said, I said, wow, this is a problem, right? I, I, it was, it was, um, it was eye-opening and it was developing my own understanding and knowledge, the depth of the reality of racism and white supremacy written into not only our history, but legislated in decisions that were made um, throughout different historical periods. So that was a whole learning process with the, with the research of really coming to understand what is the history of legislated white supremacy in this country that, that denied access to people of color in terms of education and land ownership and home ownership and economic and social security. All of those elements that are the structures of disparity in this country were legislated, right? They were, they were projects that were created. They didn't fall from the sky. And so, so even learning that history was eye-opening for me. And I got to the end of kind of the, the training. Uh, I got to the end of uh, uh, kind of thinking about um, what I might need to know to really understand some of the contours of racism and white supremacy in this country. And I said, oh, as a Christian theologian, I want to speak to that. But it's too bad it really has nothing to do with the discipline I've been trained in. Until I started looking at the legislation and I really saw that it was white Christians legislating to create the systems of white Christian supremacy in this country, right? So legislation that had to do with the dispossession of indigenous peoples. Legislators and politicians and educators were reasoning with the Genesis text that the indigenous people really weren't following God's plan and so we can dispossess them of their land because we have the right to do that somehow, right? When it came to the, the full uh, hundreds of years of history of enslavement, 
that's not just a, a, an accident of history. It's not just an accident of legislation. It was white Christians who reasoned with our biblical text in order to justify this hundreds of years of uh, unpaid labor, right? Uh, hundreds of years of an economic crime, right, that went into building up white Christian individuals and white Christian institutions. So I think that that was the, the part that was the most surprising to me was the ways in which the Christian scripture that is the heart of my discipline had been used as a theologic for creating the systems of white Christian supremacy in this country. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting because anytime you hear um, debate on a bill, I mean, you, you, you studied the, the history of that debate and understood what the rhetoric that was being used and, and it was Christian um, rhetoric up, yeah. about giving Christians a leg up over everybody so that, that everything would be, be a Christian society. It, it was a very interesting, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you have this, this phrase that you use, the, the witchcraft of white supremacy. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that as a way of talking about the dynamic of, of, of what, how, how that works. Yeah. So uh, when, when, when folks hear the phrase white supremacy, we often think in this country, we often think about the KKK or we think about neo-Nazis. Uh, we think about these outward expressions of obvious racism. And, and in, in trying to think about the witchcraft of white supremacy, I needed to think a little bit um, in a different way about what I was trying to convey with the very concept of white supremacy, right? So it, the, the, the um, expressions that, we might come, that might come to mind the most, most readily, the KKK and neo-Nazis are an extreme form of white supremacy, but all the way through U.S. history and even embedded, if, even embedded in some of the, the projects today is an ideology of white supremacy, right? This idea that somehow white people, white culture, white religion is the best, kind of put most simply, um, structures the way that white citizens in this country have thought about Right, their rights and their access and their uh, what they build up as resources. Right, they think well, white citizens are um, deserving. Right of all of these things, and the ideology of white supremacy says, well, the indigenous people, you know, they're not really as as cultured. Right? The indigenous people, they're not as rational. This is in the early phases with enlightenment thought and, and, and the colonial project. Um, that the ideology of white supremacy was an ideology that was broadly shared in our nation's history. And that ideology gave the foundation for legislation that disadvantaged indigenous people, disadvantaged the Africans who were enslaved, disadvantaged uh, Latinx populations, disadvantaged, uh, uh, for example, the Chinese when they came and, and built up the country and then were excluded. So this, this ideology of white supremacy is the foundation, right? But the ideology of white supremacy then created the systems that elevated white citizens above people of color in this country. So the ideology of, of white supremacy said, well, we really want to establish schools and we really want to give that benefit first and foremost to white Americans, to white citizens, right? The ideology is the foundation. The legislation gives advantages, gives resources through education, for example. Uh, and then what happens is white citizens, you know, are um, elevated in the practices of education and gain access to other social locations through that. The same thing happens with our economic system, right? That legislation is put in place, for example, with home ownership. And home ownership, the ideology in the, in, uh, the, the practices of home ownership from out of uh, the establishment of the Federal Housing Administration in, in uh, 1934, the ideology was, look, we want to protect home ownership for American citizens. We want to protect home ownership for white Americans. And when we look at the way that racism plays into um, uh, 
uh, land values. This was the logic that was used in, I'm gonna do a little show and tell with my appraising manual. So the logic that was used in the, in the real estate appraising manual was, was, look, we have to protect land values, right? And we protect land values by making sure that the right kind of races are inhabiting the, the locations in which we're doing our mortgage lending. Mm -hmm. And when, they, when the system was set up, white Europeans were put at the top of the racial hierarchy and the, the racial hierarchy, right? I don't know if you could see this. Yeah. The racial hierarchy in the mortgage lending manual betrays an ideology of white supremacy and then gives mortgage lending to white families and denies it to people of color. Yeah. So the ideology is the foundation. It gets written into legislation and then people of color are denied access to those things that would um, uh, uh, give them um, a um, access to particular subject positions of power. Right. And so the witchcraft of white supremacy is that an ideology actually then created the disparity that we see today, the disparity in which and it depends on which calculation you're using, but the disparity in which white households have somewhere between 13 and 20 times the median wealth uh, in relation to black and Latino households. Well, that's witchcraft, right? That's the creation of a supremacy from out of an ideology through legislation. Yeah. That, thank you very much. I wonder um, a couple of things. Like, so, so now that we know something about this, and and I'm totally with you. I mean, we're just we're so close to the time of slavery too. I mean, it's just like it, it's just like a blink of an eye when we when there was slavery in North America, and and we're still living with all those effects, including you know the the, the the way that racism evolves and changes. So, so that you have, you know, the, the, the um, real estate legislation and the, and the immigration legislation of the 20th century and the mass incarceration of the 21st century. Uh, so so what, do, what do you think we should, what do we do now that we start to understand this connection between this idea of Christian supremacy, of Christians thinking of themselves as the, 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 the best religion, uh, I mean, it's connection to, to racial uh, racism, which is the thinking that you're the, the best race or there is a best race. Yeah, um, so I, I wanna think about that on a number of levels. Uh, and I don't want to miss the, the level of our congregations, right? The level of our, our, our faith communities. Um, but the, the, the place that I go to first is to, um, to the anti-racism training of the People's Institute. One of the principal ideas that they ask their trainees to consider is the locations in which they are what they call gatekeepers, right? Where do I have access to either allow an unjust racist status quo to continue or where I can intervene, right? And have some sort of a practice that, that asks for an anti-racist stance and anti-racist actions. Mm -hmm. So the question, what do we do, right? Would depend on our location. So myself as an educator, right? I inherited white theology. I inherited theology done by white Europeans uh, and largely white theologians in the US. Um, and that uh, shapes, right, the theology that's produced. So I have to ask the question, in what ways does theology continue to participate in systems of white supremacy? And where do I have the places where I'm a gatekeeper, right, to do something differently? And so each person has to ask, well, what what systems are you part of? What structures are you part of? Uh, what are the places where if you continue just doing what we're doing and not interrupting anything, we're just allowing a racist status quo, right, to continue its momentum through history. Um, so I ask my students to think about each era as having a racial project. That comes from uh, sociologists uh, who talk about a racial project in any given era. I wanna talk about a religio-racial project, but in every era, Right, we look and we see, well, how were the races created? 
right? How were they constructed? Who was sorted into them? And, and what benefits or denials of benefits were given in a particular era, right? So a denial of access to home ownership or a denial of access to education, right? But we also have a racial... We also have a racial project in our moment. And so we need to look and see what is the racial moment of our, pro what is the racial project of our moment? And how are we gatekeepers to either participate in that, disrupt it, right? Allow it to continue. Um, a second level that we need to think about is, uh, is legislation. Right, so how are we active in terms of the political process? Um, my students were surprised to hear about uh, HR 40, which is the resolution to create a commission to study the possibility of reparations. It's not even a commission to figure out reparations. It's a committee to study whether we can have reparations, right? And 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 the and they said, well, you know, how come everybody's not on board with this? I said, well, you know, this is the political process. You have to be part of that. Um, and then the third area, because I I do work in the in the area of theology, and you and I I share that. I want to ask: to what extent is the reality of white supremacy named as a sin? in our congregations, right? And so the places where our, you know, it's one of the reasons why I named the book what I did. Um, James Cohn, and I, I think it was, um, it's the early 2000s somewhere, maybe it's 2004. Uh, he titled one of his essays, uh, uh, Theology's Greatest Sin, right. Silence in the Face of White Supremacy. Mm -hmm. Well, that was my experience. My experience was that I could be a theologian with all of this, uh, uh, all of these degrees and this prestige, and I had never once had to say anything about the sin of white supremacy. But that's the sin that I live in. That's the sin that structures the fact that my institution is predominantly white, that my neighborhood is predominantly white, that the, that the kind of education that my kids get in my neighborhood is significantly different from the neighborhood next door, which is a community of color, right? I live in a society that is saturated by the sin of white supremacy, but it's an option whether my pastor or my preacher cares to say anything about it and, and doesn't want to disrupt the comfortable place that, that, that his, in my case, parishioners are in for fear of turning people off, having them leave. One more reason why people might leave the church. Right, right. And how, like, what's, what's been the response to your work? Like, um, have there been crit criticisms that you just thought, ah, oh, that person really understands my work or and, and how have African Americans in particular read your work and, and responded to it? So I have, um, <clears throat> I have done presentations on the book in different types of settings. Yeah. Um, and when I am in a largely white, uh, with a, a largely white audience, um, very often the response is, you know, this was, this was not a history that we knew. I'm so surprised by so many of these things. A, lip, a you know, kind of a sense of, of crisis and what do we do now? When I've done this in mixed communities or in largely uh, communities of color, there's a lot more nodding all the way through, nodding all the way through saying, yes, this is, this is our reality. It's obvious. <laughs> yeah, but yes, what do we do now, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, and so, um, you know, I think that, I think that, that there's been a, a, a a very positive reception, right? I think that what I've tried to do in the book is say, let's just know this history, right? I'm not, I'm not making this stuff up. One of the most surprising, when the book first came out, one of the most surprising negative reactions was, oh my God, she's saying that Christians created racism in this country? I said, well, who, who else was there, right? Like, <laughs> who else did she made it? Right? So it's like, well, yeah. So, you know, so let's take some responsibility for the undoing that needs to happen. Right. Um, so that's, that's kind of been the response. Yeah, that's great. Well, it's, it's a really important book and, and, um, and I enjoyed it for just the specificity of the examples that you used and, and, you know, for the theory that you put in there too, to, to help us to um, understand what those examples are pointing us to, to, I, I really appreciated that work. I've been thinking a lot about you these last few years, though. 
Um, a lot of the work that you've been doing is in um, kind of like world religions and religious dialogue, but it also in um, feminism and theology and, and this Me Too movement that has come up. And I, I, there have been a few times I thought, oh, I wonder what Janine thinks about this. And you know, just uh, um, like, how is your perspective different because of the, 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 the depth to which you've studied this issue? Um, uh, how, could you rephrase that? Just because I'm not, I want to, yeah. I want to hone in on what it is. Are you asking about the, the, the feminist shaping in light of racism and religious diversity? Yeah. Rephrase that. Yeah, so, I mean, so we, so we, so, um, I want to hear a little bit about just what your, your study of the, of women and religion and the, and, 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 uh, and the way that, uh, women have been discriminated against, their voices have not been heard, and, um, and, and how that changes your percept perception of the Me Too movement versus someone else who hasn't studied those questions in so much depth. I think, I, I think, I, I think I'm hearing your question. Um, so I was uh, born into uh, a Christianity and a Catholicism that already had feminist uh, theological voices in the mix. So I was born in 1969 and I was born into a very vibrant sense that the women's movement had something to say both to our lives as human beings and to our lives as Christians. Uh, I think that I have arrived in the place that I am 50 years later with the feeling like, yeah, the changes that need to happen are so uh, grave and uh, substantive that I feel like I was sold a little bit of a bill of goods, right, in terms of feminist theology and the, and the feminist movement, that, that there are still structures in society in which power still resides with wealthy white men. So my, my, percept, my, my perspective on the Me Too movement is this sense that, once again, women and uh, allies are raising their voices of concern that the that the balance of power right continues to reside with a few uh and i and i think that my response to the me too movement is yeah we've got a we've got an empire problem here we have power and wealth and uh resources that are uh, concentrated in the few and the CEOs and the legislators and the pastors and the and university the professors, <laughs> right? All of those folks continue to be disproportionately white men, right? right. right? And so, so it's, a, it's, one, um, it's one voicing of, uh, uh, a long-term problem and a continuing problem, right? And so I think that the Me Too, the Me Too movement for me really has said, look, this has not been, this has not been fixed, right? The, the, the strides that, that women made and the strides that we made as a society, we have to continue to do that because what we thought had been achieved in terms of balance of power, in terms of balance of voice, in terms of balance of rights, uh, still is disproportionately benefiting some more than others. Yeah, and I love what you said that I took in, like the new thing I just got from that is, you know, when you're in, in a society where inequality is such a severe problem, this becomes an even more severe problem too. So, it, so that even just kind of apart from the gender implications of, of this, um, the inequality is is definitely making it a, a much more severe problem when when some people have so much and, and and so many people have so 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 much less and so even like tax policies of the 1970s and 1980s 
are connected to gender um, gender problems that we have in the 21st century. But you know, um, um, Janine, we have one of these great things. Uh, our tradition is to take questions from the from our, our, our audience, and we're just starting to get a zillion questions. All so, right. um, so I'm going to go to those questions, which I think are going to be really good ones. Here's a question from David: Do you feel that Christian rhetoric that is used at this very moment? is still used to suppress people of color, the LGBTQ community. How can we as a church change this? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's almost the question that I've been asking my students throughout this, this, this semester. We've been studying, uh, uh, we haven't read the book, but we've been studying things around the book. Um, and my students largely are students who haven't been necessarily compelled by the Christian story and the Christian message. Um, and they kind of only hear the ways in which uh, scripture is mobilized in ways that uh, deny rights in these various in these various ways. Uh, and they, you know, we've been wrestling all the way through these 15 weeks and I've asked, well, should we just give up? Should we just stop using the scriptural text? Should we go on to argue and reason in other ways? Um, and I've had to give what well, the students have have done a very good job of saying, well, wait, wait a minute. If, if other people are using your scripture, my scripture, for these ends, right? Shouldn't I be doubling down and finding those places in my scripture where I say, you know what, it, it, it can't be used that way. It shouldn't be used that way. Um, and one of, the, one of the most beautiful books recently, again, can't know, don't know if you guys can see it, it's Stephen Patterson's The Forgotten Creed. Um, so if you're interested in alternative biblical resources. He basically says, if you, Patterson goes through the, the, um, the layers of the Christian uh, New Testament, and he says, if you get back to what the his scholars think might have been the original creed, it's the creed that Paul uh, uh, includes in Galatians 3, 26 to 28. Mm -hmm. Neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor three, free, mm -hmm. neither male nor female, and he says, well, if, if we can imagine that, as historians have, that this was the fundamental seed that the, that the Christian, that the Jesus movement was using, then all of this rhetoric that we see that divides people, Patterson says, that, that's, not, that's not what he thinks, right, was the seed and the heart of the message. So the question is, can we, right, can we find the resources in our scripture? And since those are the those are the not only the fields that I've been trained in, but also I think that the that the story of Scripture is just such a powerful human story about what it is to to love, right? And to attempt to love in a world where things are stacked against you, in a world where some have power over others, where with in a world of empire, like that 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 vision and that message was compelling to people centuries ago. I want to reclaim that scripture as an anti-imperial, right? As a as a scriptural uh, guide to uh, a world that uh, aims and, a, and and a people that aim to transcend those divisions. Right, right. I've got a question from my friend Eric, um, uh, who I love. This guy's so wonderful. Um, but he, he quotes um, Ephesians chapter six, verse five. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling That's and the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. I mean, so that was used in my school in the 1960s to still justify enslavement of African Americans. It sounds like the justification of white supremacy. Can the church continue this? The silence to white supremacy and the agreement to the sanctity of whiteness? Yeah. That's a, that it, I'm you 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 missed my reaction, but that is that that is astounding that in the 1960s or 70s whatever that whatever the that 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 was heard right as an authoritative uh, uh, argument in the tradition. the The fact of the matter is that precisely that that. Um, uh, statement in the biblical text was used all the way through U.S. history as justification by those who, you know, by, by all, of the, all of the Christians who were developing and supporting and defending enslavement, including bishops and archbishops in, 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 in many congregations. Um, uh, 
what Patterson does with that is he says, look, this earliest creed that said neither slave nor free, this earliest creed that was this vision of possibility, it, it never really took root. Even Paul, even, even Paul uh, kind of wiggles around, even the authentic Paul, right? So the, histor the biblical scholars were saying, well, some biblical scholars will say, oh, well, well, these parts, when it says it, that's not really even Paul. But when, the, when you get to those places where Paul really does kind of say, well, he kind of waffles. This is, what, this is Patterson's presentation. That, that Christians have never quite lived up to their, to their own creed. Yeah, right? yeah. And so when I talk about this with my students, I, I say, well, is the story of Christianity then, is it, is it a tragedy? Is it a story of, of what could have been possible but has never been possible? Or is it a story of eschatological hope, right? Of hope of who we're supposed to be and that we still can do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that, I think that uh, we need to, the question was actually, can the, can the church still do this? Yeah. And I think the rest of us have to say, absolutely not. That's what the church has done. Right. And, and, and simply because it's found in the scriptural text doesn't mean that, that, that we can accept it. And we have to use the tools of biblical scholarship to, to, to engage that text in a new way. Yeah, definitely. It's like a little bit like Martin Luther said, that not all scripture is created equal. And it's, it's like the spirit in which the spirit that enlivens it, that gives it life. That's what really matters. Um, we have a question from Gail. Um, she says, as a Canadian, much of the project of white supremacy that you are teasing out sounds very familiar to the histories and practices of British colonialism. How do you see these ideas intersecting with nationalism, imperialism, capitalism? Are there national particularities? Oh yeah, yeah. That is a really great. That is a really great question. That I will have to confess that what I have, what I have been able to trace, is local episodes in a national story, in a U.S. national story. So I've kept my attention uh, kind of uh, framed in terms of U.S. legislation, in terms of U.S. history. Um, but there must be parallels, right? And so, so uh, the, it's really for the Canadian historian or the Canadian, uh, uh, you know, reader to read this and say, well, wait a minute, if we can see that these are the broad strokes, what's interesting here is that the broad strokes have their roots in enlightenment thought, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can trace, we can trace a shared heritage in terms of um, global movements of ideas through Enlightenment thought. We can trace a shared heritage in terms of, of uh, imperial projects, colonial projects. But then the question of national identities is going to shape that in a particular way, right? So what were the, what were the capitalist systems in the U.S.? right? The building of the railroad was one distinctive capitalist system that was racialized, that had religious exclusions in terms of bringing the Chinese in as workers, right? A capitalist project, but then denying them citizenship on the basis of them not being assimilable because they're not Christian, right? right. Um, and so we'd have to look at the Canadian context and say, okay, what are the shared, right? What are the, sh what are the similarities? But what's just, you know, then that becomes interesting. What's distinctive about what's going on in the Canadian context, right? That might, that might shape that history in a particular way, right? And so that, so that goes both. So um, what I'm describing is a, a broad history that's going to have national differences, but it also is going to have local differences, right? So we can look at the era of Jim Crow and the era of lynching, right? And we can say, okay, that was a national era. How did it play out in the South? Okay, we think it maybe only played out in the South. No, how did it play out in Omaha? How did it play out in Minnesota? How did it play out in Indiana, right? And so thinking about the ways that some of these episodes give us a broad framework to then ask the particular stories of our own histories, both national and individual and institutional. Yeah, good. Those, that's a great way to approach it. Here's a question from Pam. What do you consider our res responsibility is in going beyond how we live in and with white supremacy and the proposals of Foucault about how we see quote normal and actually the concept of race altogether? <laughs> 
Okay, that was a hard one when you threw Foucault in there. So give me the... I know, it didn't make it more complicated. <laughs> what do you consider our responsibility is in going yeah. beyond how we live in and with white supremacy? And then um, the Foucault is just about the normal part. Like how do we normalize um, structures that are so deep within us that, um, that, that it raises a concept in that like much, much deeper frame? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to get, I'd like to get the Foucault in there. I got, that's having me think on my feet quite a bit. Um, what's our responsibility? Uh, so I'm answering as a white Christian. And I think that my responsibility is to know the history first and foremost, to see the ways that I have benefited from this racist history, because I have, uh, and to ask the questions of where can I do something differently. Um, uh, so I'm going to throw Foucault in here, and I don't know if this is the, the element of Foucault that, you're, that the question is, is asking, but Foucault has a notion of asking us to think about power in a new way. So I've been using the frame or the theoretical frame of empire, where power is only in the hands of a few, and that is uh, true of many of our institutions. But Foucault has a notion of bio, bio power, something like that, uh, in which all of the members of, you know, kind of an organism or an institution or a society have a role to play, right, in the perpetuation of what's normative, who has rights, um, where, who has access and power, et cetera. So if we were to use Foucault, each of us has responsibility in those locations in which we participate in systems of white supremacy. Um, and so the responsibility, you know, so I can look at my own institution and I can see the ways that my institution gives me benefits like a paycheck, gives me benefits like time to read and to teach, right? Um, and that my institution has benefited from structures and systems of white supremacy, right? So what is my responsibility within that system as a member of that system of that institution What's my responsibility, right, to be part of the shared power, right, that flows through that institution? Um, and so I try to think about those places where my work can do something differently in the choices that I make. Yeah. Here's a question from Alex. Is there a reason that the topic of racism has shifted to discrimination? Is the topic of racism in Christianity so uncomfortable that we need to change the subject? I think that it is uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, I know that my own teaching, uh, many of my students, I, I have ha I've had to find ways to introduce this. They say, well, wh why are you, you're making us feel guilty, right? We, we didn't do this. Uh, we're nice people, right? We're not racist. Nobody wants to be racist, right? Um, and yet, if we live with the, uh, reaping the benefits of a racist system, we have to recognize those ways in which we are racist, right? Um, and so, so um, I think that the shift of discrimination says, well, I'm not participating in that, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not discriminating against people on the basis of their race, right? But, but the shift to discrimination ignores the invisible dimension of institutionalized racism. Um, I think it is uncomfortable. Nobody wants to be racist. Nobody wants to name the, the ideas that they have been taught. No white person wants to, not, wants to name the ideas that they've been taught, the ways that they've been taught that white culture and white religion and white people are, are better than other people. Right? But the many white people that I have uh, had the opportunity to discuss anti-racism work with have said, yeah, that's the story I was told. It wasn't, it wasn't told directly to me. It was told through lots of patterns and projects and codes, right? Um, honestly, I think, I mean, you know, just like the, the th that rational layer of us is just such a thin little veneer over just these deep subconscious images that, that are, are really the, the, the majority of what we are. Um, but we have more questions, and I just, I, I, um, that was a great question, Alex. Thank you very much.
Um, this next question, um, it's more about um, uh, the future of the role of women in Catholic leadership or priesthood in the future. And you said pretty much not in our lifetime. Do you have anything to add to that? Or is that, is that pretty much? Your, no, I, your... I said, I said institutional priesthood, not in our lifetime. Wow. Um, and, and, and I would simultaneously say, yeah, Catholic women continuing to be part of making the choice because yeah. it's a choice to continue to be part of an institution and finding those places, finding those places that are not uh, under patriarchal control, right? But there's a lot of places that still are, right? Very much under patriarchal control. Um, so the difference between um, uh, priesthood and leadership is a very big difference for, for me, right? That women, Catholic women will continue to be leaders on so many levels uh, in, in, the, in the wide range of, of ways that Catholics are continuing to engage their faith today. Yeah, you're definitely one of those leaders and we appreciate that. Here's another question from Eric. Ibrahim X. Kendi in Atlantic Monthly in May described the US as a slaveholder republic. He wrote, quote, slaveholders desire to state that wholly secured their individual freedom to enslave, not to mention their freedom to exploit, to impoverish, to demean, to silence, and to kill the demean. The freedom to harm, the freedom to infect. Is there a Christian theological response to this exploitative, one-sided freedom? I, I know it's a it's a uh, answer I've already given. I think we have to name it as sin. I think I think we have to say that the the many and various ways, the many and various uh, forms of legislation that continue to funnel resources to white communities in this country. I think we have to name it as sin. And the and the problem is, of course, that many 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 of white of us white Christians are complicit in that sin. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and so, so you know, uh, the ability of the of the the white uh, owner of property to defend his or her property, right, at the harm to others. Right, right. Well, even the stand your ground laws in the South right now. I mean, when you talk about like how we were talking about how racism evolves and what is what is our racial project. Um, you know, that's an example of our generation is the stand your ground gen generation, which is instituted, you know, um, yeah. But, our, but our, our project is also giving all kinds of COVID relief to corporations so that, so that those of us who are in those, uh, those um, yeah. economic projects, right, yeah. that we don't, want, we don't want to limit our ability to get on an airplane and fly across the country, right? So we're gonna devote common resources to corporations and we're not gonna devote those resources to the care of my neighbors in the Bronx. So right? we have another, another question from my friend, Lindy. She's super bright. You present a path toward dissolving institutional racism with the concept of the gatekeeper. It is a difficult journey to challenge the thief or the bandit and attempt to lead or change them as a shepherd. So that refers to last Sunday's reading um, for, for the gospel. I am curious about how your students or you resolve to disrupt or take a stand to interrupt systemic racism in their lives. After experiencing your class, how would they go into communities of color differently? Uh, I am hoping they go into all, I'm, I'm actually hoping that they go into their professions differently. Right? I'm asking them to see each of these era's projects and I'm asking them to say, okay, you're a business major. What do you know about the economic system that founded this country? And you'd be surprised that all of my business students say, well, we don't study that. That's in the past. And I say, where do you think that money went, right? And so I hope that they go into their professions in a different way. I hope that they go into their communications, uh, uh, you know, their lives as communications majors, and they ask themselves the question, what's coded 
right, in this message that we're presenting? Is it coded for a white audience? Is it coded with white interests in mind? Um, and so I'm hoping that they go, I, I'm hoping that they go into their professions uh, empowered to see their role as agents within a religio-racial project. I hope that my white students will go into communities of color um, humbled. I hope that they will go into communities of color recognizing the resilience. I hope that they will enter into spaces uh, in, in work with uh, people of color and colleagues of color in a way that recognizes and withholds some of their own white privilege. There's so many questions I wish we could have asked you. I wanted to know what your favorite classes were in college and in graduate school and which of our teachers most influenced you. And I wanted to, I wanted to hear more about the election in 2016 and just the way that white supremacy has changed just since the time you started writing this book. But there's just not enough time for all. And you know, I also want to make sure that everybody who's watching us realizes you know, this is one area of your life. You have other scholarly interests that are, that are very important scholarly interests too. But, we're so grateful for you being with us today, Janine. It was it's such a blessing that you spent the time and stayed up and, and shared some of the things that you're working on. And I'm, I'm so grateful for our audience too, um, with the, the powerful questions and the important observations that folks made. Um, we um, have uh, next week, we'll be having Catherine Sonderegger, a renowned Anglican scholar and teacher at Virginia Theological Seminary. She's the author of the Monumental Systematic Theology, Volume 1, The Doctrine of God. Um, you can help us to bring the arts to life at Grace with a gift to the forum. Please join gracecathedralorg donate to give Thank you for joining the forum online. And especially thanks to you, Janine. We're so glad to see you. And, um, and uh, we'll definitely be um, paying close attention to what your next projects are. Thank you so much for, for being with us here on the online forum. And thank you for having me. And thanks to all of you who joined us because engaging in the questions helps me to see, right, that there are other places for this work to go. Yeah, I can't wait to hear your, read your book on, um, on uh, white supremacy in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, and take care. God bless.